Mississippi coast, um, the as well as the Baltic, the uh, uh, early European farmers were actually not able to penetrate into those regions for thousands of years. And in other areas, uh, like forests, where the uh, soil was too poor for farming, the uh, Western hunter-gatherers were able to hold out and didn't really mix that much at all with the early European farmers. Um, the cardiac ware were a little bit different since their uh, ecologies that they like to colonize did overlap with the Western hunter-gatherers. We do see some cardiac ware peoples in northern Italy and in southern France that are actually up to uh, 30 percent Western, I mean, 20 to 30 percent Western hunter-gatherer in ancestry. Uh, so they are mixing quite extensively. Uh, we also do see there's kind of um, the hunt Western hunter-gatherers in the Danube River Basin uh, also appear to have kept a, a fairly dense population right along the Black Sea coast. So they do recover and uh, go on to mix with the um, early European farmers, um, you know, in the 5,000s and uh, 4,000s, even before the uh, Great Cataclysm that we'll talk about. The uh, early European farmers at this time, they were called a Neolithic people. That is, they had, uh, you know, stone tools. They didn't have metal. Um, you know, they would go and make spearheads, uh, arrowheads, um, you know, stone axes, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's not as easy to, it's actually very difficult to go and clear forests um, with that sort of technology. Um, so that made it so they were unable to uh, change their ecology in a way that, um, you know, their successors would. Uh, they did go, they did have a slash and burn farming in some areas. They would light fires, um, you know, burn areas down to go and make it so the soil was replenished. Um, and uh, that, you know, worked somewhat well for them, uh, even though it could cause uh, long-term issues once they've, you know, reached a um, large enough population because the issue they started to run into, um, you know, a thousand years after they had colonized Europe was that they simply had too many people. They had filled up the areas that they had colonized. Uh, Germany, um, you know, Germany in particular, we have a lot of evidence for due to, uh, you know, the German government's very generous archaeological spending. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if this was true elsewhere as well. But these kind of... Uh, little chiefdoms, um, you know, there's not much evidence they were organized into large-scale states uh, by kind of the turn of the uh, 5th millennium BC. Um, you know, they went and, uh, you know, they just ran out of food. They uh, became shorter than they had been at any point previous, and we start seeing evidence of uh, large-scale, you know, crises, you know, right around 4900, 4800 BC. Um, there is evidence of, uh, in some sites of mass human sacrifice and cannibalism, particularly in Western Germany, as well as in Northeastern France and the Paris basin. Um, you know, just horrible, horrible things. And whatever happened, um, you know, it did seem to spark this sort of Aztec tier religion where, you know, there was just a religion of unimaginable cruelty. But what caused this, it's difficult to say. Um, they did appear to have primitive, uh, or I shouldn't say primitive, they did have knowledge of uh, solar cycles, lunar cycles, that sort of thing. There are uh, um, stone circles that we'll see in certain uh, settlements in southern Europe. You know, so this is the northern branch, not the Mediterranean branch we're talking of. And... Um, you know, it's very possible that they were organizing, well, it's actually not possible, they were definitely organizing a large sacrifices of animals and men, um, you know, during this kind of crisis around 4900 to 4800 BC. Now, they did recover from this crisis, um, and their civilization would last for another 400 years, uh, up until 4400 BC, but I'm uh, kind of getting ahead of myself here. brought in uh, animals with them. They brought pigs, uh, most notably, um, dogs, all, all sorts of other animals. You know, these were very important in their society. Um, one of the possible reasons for their initial successes was the introduction of these pigs. 
the pigs they brought were actually uh, very distinctive from the pigs that were native to Europe before them. Uh, now, what we see, or what we know from the Americas, um, is that when Hernando de Soto uh, settled, or not settled, uh, explored the, the American Southeast, uh, he brought his pigs with him as well, drove them along. And uh, these pigs carry all sorts of diseases, notably tuberculosis, um, you know, and all sorts of nasty stuff. And when de Soto's pigs got loose, they went into the forests and they uh, spread these diseases among the Amerindians who were hunting them. And it caused this enormous population collapse amongst the uh, Amerindian populations all over North America. Now, could something have like this have happened in Europe in the uh, sixth millennium BC? It's very possible. I think it's actually quite likely. The uh, agricultural societies of uh, the Middle East that the early European farmers had come from had population societies that were probably in the tens of thousands uh, per social unit um, or chiefdom. The, uh, so not really states, but uh, definitely things that were organized. Um, the Western uh, hunter-gatherers and the Eastern hunter-gatherers and all these other groups in Europe, they didn't really have anything that could uh, match that. You know, they were in bands, you know, perhaps of a few dozen. Um, you know, their largest chiefdoms were probably 10,000. Um, you know, we do see in Ireland, for instance, the uh, hunter-gatherer population probably normally numbered around 4,000 and as high as 10,000. Uh, they did go, the Western hunter-gatherers did have uh, knowledge of kinship. They would be very, very careful about avoiding marrying immediate relatives. So they were, uh, you know, even though they were technologically primitive, they did know something about heredity. Um, nonetheless, you know, their societies were just nothing on the level of the uh, early European farmers, the EEFs. Um, so when these pigs were introduced, the... Uh, or going back, so diseases, uh, actually in history, they've gotten worse and worse as time has gone on. There's a very good book called Plagues and Peoples, which discusses this. Uh, when you have, um, you know, a very small population, you know, especially of hunter-gatherers hunting wild animals, and you're not really in super close contact with uh, domesticated animals, you're less likely to generate diseases than, uh, you know, if you're living in... Um, you know, kind of an agricultural settlement where it's very dense, everyone's together, uh, it's particularly the animals. There's a lot of opportunities for animal diseases or animal issues to go and cross over to humans in these kind of uh, Neolithic settlements that the hunter-gatherers just don't have. Um, and in Plagues and Peoples, he calls this a disease burden, the uh, you know ability of a society to generate diseases. And the early European uh, farmers, given their health, it wasn't all poor nutrition, um, certain it had to do with, um, you know, this disease burden as well that made them so short and uh, so unhealthy, particularly once they had, uh, you know, reached their population maximum in a lot of parts of Europe. Um, but even before this, they would have certainly had uh, many diseases that the Western hunter-gatherers would have never been exposed to. Um, there's not really evidence for large-scale trade at that point in the 6th millennium BC Europe. Uh, that comes later in the uh, 4,000s, particularly in the late 4,000s, when we start to see uh, transcontinental trade routes. Uh, so going on, um, you have uh, the early European farmers. They've settled most of Europe by the uh, end of the 6th millennium. And uh, they go, and there are areas that are held out by the Western hunter-gatherers. You have the Western hunter-gatherers in the forests along the coast. What were their relationships like? We do have some evidence. Um, it's strongest in the Low Countries, modern-day Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, uh, northwestern Germany. And there is a depopulated frontier, actually, where there's very, very few archaeological finds of any kind uh, between these Western hunter-gatherer settlements, the Low Countries, as well as the uh, EEF settlements in uh, northeastern France and northwestern Germany. And the uh, distinctiveness was... To more or less total. There was no trade of any kind, as far as we can tell, other than stone axes, which very well may have been uh, captured. Um, you know, there's finds of uh, people with, you know, arrows in the rib cages, um, you know, just very, very cruel treatment, obvious signs of warfare. 
Um, there's no technological trade. You don't see the uh, Western hunter-gatherers adopting any farming tools. You don't see the uh, EEFs adopting any kind of fishing tools that the uh, Western hunter-gatherers in the low countries were very much known for. Burial customs were completely different. Um, so it's very evident there was tremendous amount of, uh, you know, very, very brutal warfare going on between the WHGs and the EEFs, and they did not view each other as fully human uh, we see similar patterns in the American Southwest in particular. Um, you know, the uh, you have agricultural groups like the Fremont culture, the Anasazi, and uh, they had very, very bitter relations with the uh, Numic speaking and the Dene speaking uh, hunter-gatherer tribes that lived in more marginal environments. And... Um, in the end, in the American Southwest, the uh, hunter-gatherer tribes did overthrow the agricultural tribes, wiping them out in areas like Utah. And um, we do see a similar pattern in uh, around 4400 BC. Um, so we have, uh, you know, one example I like to use is the Hopi. They're very clearly a uh, continuation of the Puebloan peoples um, of the American Southwest. However, they do speak an udo aztecan language, the language of the uh, you know, kind of migratory hunter-gatherer peoples that lived in the desert and would live off agave. Um, you know, and I think that's very similar to what I'm about to describe next. So in the middle of the fifth millennium uh, BC, we do see, um, you know, some trade. You have uh, the development and spread of copper working out of the Balkans. Uh, this mostly spreads to the east. There's definite contacts with the uh, Caucasian civilizations, um, you know, across the Black Sea. Uh, so there was definitely some sort of sea trade going on there, not necessarily a uh, land trade, since there were some very hostile tribes in uh, the Ukraine and uh, kind of the modern day North Caucasus region that were not, um, you know, that friendly to anyone, really. And... Um, this copper, it would have had, of course, revolutionary effects. The old uh, stone-armed peoples wouldn't have been able to match copper weaponry. You would have had... Uh, we don't have any evidence specifically of a smith case, but we do know from uh, anthropology across the world that in a lot of areas, uh, metalworking is done by a specific case. It's not a profession. It's a, a you know, almost a blood-defined group in a lot of cases. Um, with overlap with magicians and priests. It's very possible we could have seen something like that uh, coming out of the Balkans. And groups that would have had access to copper would have done uh, extremely well. Now, shortly after the introduction of copper, we actually see more or less a total collapse of civilization all over Europe. Um, you know, whether or not it was due to this copper, it's difficult to tell. Um, you know, though presumably that would have played a major role. Uh, all over Europe, though, we see the uh, EEF societies go and disintegrate, and there's a, a new society that goes and replaces them. Now we've, um, you know, and there's evidence for a large-scale, um, just total civilization collapse in the Balkans. It was probably similar everywhere else as well. Um, so what we see in Spain and Germany and France and um, Hungary and the Balkans and Italy is this hunter-gatherer resurgence. So the EEFs and a lot of, you know, especially from the northern branch, were about 95% EEF in ancestry and had only mixed maybe like 5% with the uh, Western hunter-gatherers. It was a little bit different in Iberia. Um, you know, it was a little bit lower. Uh, but there's this huge increase after 4400 BC where all of a sudden all of the uh, peoples, um, you know, Germany, of the Balkans, they're all, all of a sudden, you know, 15, 25, 30 uh, percent Western hunter-gatherer and ancestry, uh, some groups, you know, even uh, rising up to about 50 percent. Um, the amount, the Y chromosomal lineages that are associated with the earliest uh, in, uh, EEF farmers that came out of uh, Anatolia, you know, they were things like G2A. There's a huge increase in Y chromosomes like I2, um, which was a uh, Y chromosomal haplogroup most commonly associated with the Western hunter gatherers. And uh, the frequency of those haplogroups, uh, you know, goes, I think the British ones, it's almost 100%. Uh, so what had happened was 
whatever the cause of this early European farmer collapse around 4400 BC, this Western hunter-gatherer resurgence, it led to these bands of Western hunter-gatherers uh, successfully going and conquering their local um, Eastern European farmer group. And it wasn't a uh, process where there was just one tribe that swept over the whole continent. It was definitely very localized collapses and very localized conquests. Uh, we see in kind of the Western Ukraine and Romania, um, the hunter-gatherers there were racially distinctive since they had a e the Eastern hunter-gatherer ancestry uh, in addition to the Western hunter-gatherer ancestry. And we see that's the hunter-gatherer component that mixes in with the um, early European farmers. You know, we see the, uh, you know, similarly racially distinctive hunter-gatherer populations that had a Magdalenian ancestry um, mix in with the uh, EEFs in um, Spain as well. And, uh, you know, it's definitely very much a uh, male-dominated um, conquest where these hunter-gatherer tribal groups would overrun the uh, early European farmer societies. And again, this is very similar to what we see in um, the American Southwest with the uh, Numic peoples uh, subjugating the Puebloan peoples. Now, interestingly, um, this kind of hybrid culture, even though it's uh, you know racially distinctive from the previous uh, early European farmer groups, um, you know, still is mostly early European farmer and ancestry. You know, there's still 60, 70 percent, uh, even 80 percent in some cases um, of this uh, early European farmer and ancestry. So I'll keep calling them uh, the Eastern European farmers, but I'll try to distinguish them by calling them the megalith builders. So after this uh, great collapse, um, you know, where these uh, EEFs were overrun by the hunter-gatherers all over Europe, uh, their civilization in the next few hundred years would reach its greatest heights. So really the uh, period from probably 3200 BC until 3600 BC is the golden age. Uh, you know, there's net, Europe doesn't match or exceed this uh, until the late third millennium actually. So in the middle of the bronze age is when this kind of a golden age is reached. Um, and a large part of that is a spread of the megaliths. So uh, what is a megalith? Stonehenge is the most famous example. There were actually hundreds of them. Uh, I believe there were probably thousands of them at one point, even though presumably a lot of them have been lost, um, you know, destroyed, that sort of thing. And uh, you have out of northwestern France, starting around 4200 BC, so the beginning of the recovery of, uh, you know, the EEFs and European uh, you know, the old European civilization. Um, the, uh, you know, development of moving large stones together and shaping them in certain ways. Uh, some of them had astronomical significance, like Stonehenge did. Um, you know, the uh, Great Boyne megaliths in Ireland also show that, um, with the solstices being very important. Um, and uh, so there's definitely religious significance to this. We have... Uh, from burials in the British Isles, Britain and Ireland, as well as in uh, France, we do see that there were uh, genetic connections. I mean, there were people who were uh, second cousins who were being buried in these things across the uh, Atlantic fringe. So it looks like there was some sort of transnational uh, blood-defined priest caste, um, or priestly class at least, that was associated um, with these uh, megaliths. Uh, they spread very quickly. They spread by sea. They hit all the coastal areas first, and then after that, spread inwards. Um, so it's very much a uh, mercantile culture. I think the process was similar to something like the Silk Road, where you see the uh, spread of Buddhism um, along the trade routes. Um, you know, you have Buddhists even in Greece on one end and then China on the other, um, you know, in the historical period. So I think we have uh, something like that that's going on that accounts for the uh, spread of the megaliths. Um, the priest class, it does appear to have uh, allowed for greater social complexity. Uh, there's evidence of genetic, genetic homogenization, particularly in France. So the, um, you know, like we discussed earlier, France was the meeting point. Um, you know, the, uh, Southern Mediterranean branch, the cardio wear EEFs, uh, met, you know, settled Southern France and the, uh, Northern branch, the linear ceramic peoples, um, you know, settled, 
um, and the RRPP peoples um, settled northern France, you know, and uh, it looks like the megalith stage of France, it looks like they were apparently united into one realm because uh, we do see the homogenization between the uh, finds in the Pyrenees um, as well as the uh, finds in the Paris Basin, which are the main two uh, places that we uh, have samples for. Um, you know, we do have a few from Brittany, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of the rest of France is uh, not as well excavated as I wish it was. Um, so it does appear there was some sort of uh, state that encompassed a lot of France, uh, or at the very least, that there was a lot of uh, population exchange between the uh, different parts of France. Um, the megaliths themselves are evidence of at least medium tier states, you know, over 100,000 people, in the sense it was very, very difficult to move these things. I mean, they're enormous blocks of stone. Um, these are people who do not have carts. You know, they're doing all of this with rope and manpower. Um, so it, it's a very big accomplishment. Um, and so we have this blood defined priest class and, uh, you know, these large or medium scale states with hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps. And, uh, you know, we also have, um, development of one of the, uh, different forms of government you could have in the stone age. And that is kind of a divine monarchy. We only have evidence for this specifically in Ireland. Um, one, the greatest megalith of all of Europe, uh, one of the Boyne megaliths, um, you know, and it's the largest. And the uh, scientists last year, they went in and they DNA sequenced uh, some of the people inside of it. And they found um, the man who was most luxuriously uh, clothed there and uh, obviously in the highest space, and uh, clearly, you know, leader or figure of great deal of importance, I was actually the product of first degree incest. And that's unheard of in uh, early European farmer society or even in uh, the hunter gatherer societies. Um, to my knowledge, there's actually no finds of first degree incest anywhere in the world for any DNA sample that's ever been fo uh, found. Uh, so it was very shocking for a lot of these people. Uh, you know, and again, I'm going into a uh, hypothesis here. Um, you know, and just making guessing. We do have uh, historical records of brother-sister marriages in Egypt. Uh, I believe there's something similar in um, the uh, Zoroastrian Persia at very point, various points. Although the Persians, I believe, were uh, more advanced and didn't really, it's more uh, religious than anything. Um, and it wasn't as big of a deal for them as it was the Egyptians. So it looks like they did go and this, uh, at the very least in Ireland, had this, um, you know, pharaonic type of god king that ruled over everyone and believed he was so much above everyone else he could only marry immediate family members. And that's how we have this, uh, you know, guy buried in this largest megalith ever. Uh, so he was very important, very powerful. Um, this was around 3200 BC, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, but I don't think that was uncommon in the megalith building period of Europe. Uh, the megalith building period of Europe, uh, so we do see a lot of social stratification, more complex societies. Uh, we also see a tremendous advance in uh, techniques for uh, agriculture, for fishing, um, you know, probably for seafaring as well. Uh, we start to see, um, you know, like I mentioned with megaliths, you know, we do see that kind of cultural spread. Uh, we do have amber finds. Amber is actually found in a uh, only a handful of parts of the world, most notably um, kind of northern uh, Poland, Denmark area. And we have amber finds all over EEF societies in the uh, northern Mediterranean, you know, all the way reaching into Egypt too. Uh, so that is evidence there was a, a very brisk sea trade going on that connected a lot of the, at least the uh, coasts. Um, there was an amber route road that went through uh, Central Europe as well. It uh, connected kind of the Vistula Basin, um, modern-day Poland, all the way down through the Alpine passes into Italy. Um, so we do see that as well. These people did have trade. And uh, so mo their societies had reached the point where they could do long-distance trade. They could engage in diplomacy. Um, they mo probably had a you know, very religious defined hierarchy. So they were not primitives by any means. Um, they also had, like I mentioned uh, earlier, the Western hunter-gatherers had kind of held off the EEFs in the far north uh, for a very you know, long time. And 
once the uh, Western hunter-gatherers and the resurgence of 4400 BC had overwhelmed the EFs in a lot of parts, that's when we do see kind of a cross-pollination of culture, uh, cultural innovations. We start to see the uh, EEFs in the north adopt, um, you know, a lot of fishing technologies. They uh, start practicing a form of burial where people are buried crouching uh, rather than traditional EEF burials. Um, so we, you know, and that's more evidence that it was the uh, Western hunter-gatherers that conquered the EEFs and not vice versa. Uh, they were imposing their religious and cultural traditions on the EEFs. Um, so, uh, you know, these technologies, um, as well as adaptation of agricultural goods uh, to northern climates, allowed the uh, EEFs to spread further in the north into the, uh, you know, kind of North Sea, into the uh, um, parts of the Baltic as well. Now, um, even though they spread into kind of the Polish part of the Baltic, the Western hunter-gatherers, uh, such as uh, the Narva culture and related cultures, managed to actually hold out in the uh, Baltic. The uh, early European farmers were not able to penetrate into the Baltic region, um, you know, probably for the same reason that the uh, Germans and the Russians had such a hard time getting in there uh, thousands of years later. It's just very forested, very swampy, um, very wet. So uh, just very difficult. Um, the uh, culture, the successor culture, the uh, Kugateni Trapalians, um, that was the EEF group that uh, ruled kind of Western Ukraine and uh, Romania. Uh, they also had difficulty pressing into Belarus and further into the steppes. Um, they looked like they were pretty much limited by the Dnieper River kind of going through central Ukraine. Um, so those were kind of the limits of... Uh, the EF, or I guess I should go on more. Um, there was a large scale colonization uh, very late in the fifth millennium, probably around, uh, you know, 4,000, 4,200 BC, where the EFs uh, did sail into Britain and Ireland and uh, set up their society there. And they spread through the uh, islands pretty quickly and only uh, mingled with a, a small number of the hunter gatherers. The hunter gatherers in Britain were probably uh, very few in number. You know, Ireland probably only had 6,000 or so, and these uh, EEF groups that were uh, sailing from uh, Britain were, you know, probably uh, far, even individual expeditions probably outnumbered them considerably. Um, so there's not that much of an increase in uh, Western hunter-gatherer ancestry in the uh, British EEFs compared to what their uh, cousins back on the mainland had. In um, Germany we see the development of the globular amphora culture, uh, which is the most WHG enriched group. Um, you know, they're kind of Eastern Germany and Poland. Some of the samples we have are almost 50% WHG, 50% EEF. Um, it's possible they were, that the uh, WHGs in the Baltic were constantly migrating in like a stream into, uh, you know, that region. And the EEFs just weren't able to uh, penetrate to the Northeast um, we see the development of the funnel beaker culture in uh, Denmark as well as southern Sweden that uh, spreads in there in the early part of the fourth millennium. Um, the funnel beakers, they were another megalithic building group. And uh, they weren't able to, they were able to colonize kind of the southern part of Sweden, Skane, but they weren't able to penetrate further north. There was a, a race called the Scandinavian hunter gatherers, who were a 50 50 mix of the eastern hunter gatherers and the Western hunter-gatherers, and they had this culture called the pitted ware culture. And uh, they were very big on fishing. Um, you know, that was their thing. Uh, they probably had seafaring technology. And uh, they were very distinctive looking. The early European farmers were kind of fair-skinned, brown hair, brown eyes. The Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, um, you know, they could be light-skinned, they could be brown, uh, they could be brown-eyed, they could be blue-eyed. Um, significant minority of them had kind of like vaguely Asiatic features. Um, so there's that as well. They would have uh, definitely looked very different from the um, early European farmers. So this is kind of the uh, kind of height, the uh, 4200 to 3600 um, period of the EEFs. They're having their golden age. They're, uh, you know, we see stuff in Bulgaria where there's all this gold and wealth and, you know, they're doing tremendously successful um, you know, the population of Europe is, you know, in the millions, um, you know, maybe the tens of millions, it's hard to say. Uh, but they were clearly doing very well for that period. So 3600 BC, 
that all changes. So the climate starts to uh, actually get colder and starts to get wetter as well. And this causes all sorts of issues. Um, the very reliable, um, you know, kind of rains that the uh, early European farmer civilization had gotten used to uh, started to become more irregular. Um, and you start to see civilizational collapses all over Europe again. It's not quite as bad, um, you know, as what we had seen in the Western hunter-gatherer resurgence of 4400 BC, but it's still not good. Um, populations probably fell to a third of what they'd been previously. Um, there's a shift, you know, large areas that have been cultivated were uh, got taken over by uh, forests. Um, you know, you do see depopulation in certain border regions that may have been the borders between uh, different chiefdoms or small states. Um, and this is all over the continent. You know, there's a decrease in uh, amber trade as well. Um, amber, you know, being very resilient, you know, we can kind of use as a proxy for, uh, you know, density of trade networks. Um, and uh, what's going on is, and we, another thing we also see too, is the spread of fortifications. There's these things called causewayed enclosures. So uh, what the farmers, you know, the EFs would do is they would build uh, kind of like a palisade wall around a settlement or a fort, and they would uh, kind of dig a trench around it, you know, almost like a moat, um, you know, which is what the, uh, you know, knights and stuff in the Middle Ages would do. Um, the uh, And they would build a causeway, you know, kind of an earthen uh, path. They would go to the gate. Um, and, you know, and these pop up all over Europe, you know, they're in the Middle East too. Uh, so from kind of 3600 BC to uh, 3200 BC, definitely an era of a lot of warfare and uh, stuff going on. Um, some of these causewayed enclosures we have, um, you know, they have finds where there's just thousands upon thousands of stone arrowheads everywhere. Um, you know, there's a burn layer where, uh, you know, the when you light something on you know, when you light a bunch of wood on fire, there's going to be charcoal and, uh, you know, all sorts of other stuff. Um, dismembered limbs, cloven skulls, um, you know, just signs that very, very bad things happened. And these uh, forts were stormed by unknown people. Um, so not a good time. And uh, as a result, you have, um, you know, whether due to warfare or due to, um, you know, the climate change, um, you do see the shift from being like almost a purely agricultural society uh, where they were, you know, focused mostly on, um, you know, growing crops, you know, maybe a few pigs, uh, chickens on the side um, to very much a more pastoral society where the uh, cattle in particular take a much, much larger role in the, uh, you know, kind of cultivation and uh, dietary habits of people. So in one sense, they're, um, you know, healthier in this dark age, even though their population is a lot smaller. Um, you know, so uh, it also makes theft easier, um, you know, rather than having kind of a Leviathan state, like what we saw in the EEF golden age. Um, you know, it looks like this was definitely more kind of small scale war bands raiding each other. Um, the civilization, the uh, funnel beakers that had kind of penetrated into Scandinavia starts to get pushed back at that point. Um, the southern hunter-gatherers kind of sweep south and destroy most of them. They do assimilate some EEF women into their, um, you know, pitted wear, you know, South, uh, Scandinavian hunter-gatherer tribe, uh, but it's not many. You know, presumably most of the uh, funnel beaker people had to flee to Denmark or uh, were killed. So it's definitely uh, not a good time to be the EEFs. Um, the Kukuteni Trapalians, they somewhat weather the, uh, you know, catastrophes of, uh, you know, kind of 3600 BC to 3200 BC better. There is evidence of uh, racial stratification and uh, race-based slavery, uh, multi-generational, that is. Um, the ancestors of the Indo-Europeans uh, looks like they'd been drifting uh, into Europe as long as a thousand years before their great invasion. Um, however, they didn't leave any genetic trace really in any of the EEF civilizations that they appear in. Um, the, e the people with Indo-European ancestry that we do find, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I think the three examples we do have, they're all grandchildren of Indo-Europeans. There's no, uh, you know, first generation or second generation uh, Indo-Europeans. 
Uh, the thing the three part Indo-European samples that we have from the Cucutini Trapelians are that they're all uh, very poorly nourished. Um, you know, they have one of them is this nine year old girl that uh, basically died because she wasn't fed enough and her bones were brittle. Um, you know, so they were definitely not treated kindly by any means. And, uh, you know, they didn't really make any contribution to uh, the EF genetics in those parts. So it was a very, very uh, bleak time. Um, you know, presumably they were being sold as slaves or captured as slaves uh, by the more advanced EEF peoples and then uh, taken back and worked to death. So uh, not a very pleasant time. Um, given that, I think there was almost certainly slavery in other areas as well, which is very difficult to uh, get a good idea on it. Um, the EEFs, uh, at least for the Kukuteni Trapelians, they were very uh, well aware of... Um, you know, their family lineages, there are evidences of uh, family graveyards. Um, you know, I believe in uh, southeastern Poland, uh, kind of western Ukraine area, um, you know, some of the grave sites show that you have cousins, second cousins, third cousins, uh, that are actually being buried in the uh, same graveyard, even though they grew up, you know, 60, 80 kilometers away, uh, which was a big distance back then. Um, so they definitely did care about their families a lot. And, uh, you know, that was very important for them. Um, so around 3200 BC, uh, you kind of see sort of a uh, revival in certain areas, uh, particularly in Britain. Um, that's when you see that great megalith that's constructed in um, Ireland with the, uh, you know, kind of God King, uh, incest born Pharaoh type figure. Um, you know, and then after that, it kind of fades away. There is a, uh, you know, a lot of Britain kind of after 3200 BC all the way to 2800 BC declines with the exception of the Orkney Islands. Um, the Orkney Islands, those are the islands kind of in the far north around Scotland. Um, a lot of cultural innovations actually start to spread out of there, like the grooved ware culture uh, spreads, starts off in the Orkney Islands and then spreads all over um, the British Isles. So it's possible there was some sort of, you know, whatever you know, whether it was a cultural influence or whether there was some sort of uh, state that was based out of the Orkneys, um, you know, it's hard to say. But the Orkneys did not experience a population decline until 2800 BC, unlike all of the other uh, EEFs in the British Isles. Um, also around 3200 BC, you have the EEFs in the Balkans, particularly in Greece, that are uh, invaded by the ancestors of the Minoans, as well as peoples associated with the Minoans. Um, the Minoans themselves were somewhat related to the EFs. They were about 80% EF in ancestry, uh, but also 20% uh, Caucasian hunter-gatherer ancestry. Uh, we do have uh, some samples of DNA for um, other groups that were living kind of Asiatic Turkey. That's where, uh, you know, Anatolia, that's where the Minoans most likely uh, came from. Uh, there were about 30% Caucasian hunter-gatherer ancestry and 70% EF in ancestry. Um, so it does look like the Minoan invasion of kind of the early European, uh, farmer Greece, um, around 3,200 was very, very destructive with a large portion of the population, uh, being replaced. There is an alternative explanation though. Um, there is one theory by Georgian archeologists, uh, that the, um, very CHG that's Caucasian hunter gatherer ancestry rich, uh, people migrated from Western Georgia, the uh, Proto-Colchian civilization, uh, directly to Greece and to Western Anatolia, and that may be the uh, source of uh, the Minoans. In that case, it would be a uh, nicer. Um, that meant they would have uh, only somewhat, you know, they would have mixed in with them. It wouldn't have been a uh, pop kind of mostly population replacement uh, type invasion as it would be if the uh, Minoans came directly from Anatolia. Uh, so that's difficult to say. Um, there's definitely more research that's needed. Uh, part of the difficulty of uh, researching that topic is due to uh, the protocolchians' tendency to build their settlements right along the beaches. Um, so a lot of that stuff's very difficult to get to. We'll need to uh, send some underwater divers, um, you know, the coasts of Greece, to Anatolia, as well as uh, right off the coast of Georgia. Um, so right around 2900 BC, uh, the most important event and all of... Uh, early European farmer history happens, the Indo-European invasion. So uh, the 
you know, the EFs, they'd been in decline for several hundred years or so. And, uh, you know, they were largely pastoral and many of them would be destroyed in this, uh, you know, cataclysmic invasion. Um, the Indo-Europeans, they, you know, for Northwestern Europeans, they're about 65% of our ancestry. Uh, for people from Southern Europe, there may be about 40% of your ancestry. Uh, for my Indian followers, they're perhaps 10 to 15% of your ancestry, uh, depending on where you're from. Um, you know, they're a very, very destructive group. Uh, they uh, f stumbled upon this massive copper mine in the Southern Urals and massively exploited it. Uh, it's one of the largest mines known from that uh, age, around 3000 BC. Um, and presumably this gave them the ability to uh, arm a lot of their troops with uh, copper and bronze uh, weapons. They uh, rode on carts as uh, mounted infantry. Um, they would have dismounted to go and fight. This would have given them a tremendous advantage over their, uh, you know, many rivals. Um, the Indo-Europeans, uh, they largely depopulated most of uh, Eastern Europe. Um, there had been earlier groups such as the ancestors of the Hittites, which migrated south as early as 3300 BC. Um, you know, it looks like they settled kind of in the northwestern uh, part of Anatolia, that's Asiatic Turkey, um, you know, near what we know as Troy, uh, most famously, even though they would move uh, further east um, into the kind of Hittite homeland that we know of. Um, but they didn't have that much of a genetic impact. But this, uh, you know, the main wave of the Indo-Europeans was a, a very, very big deal. Um, it looks like in probably one to uh, six generations, they did go and kind of overrun Scandinavia, uh, Finland, the Baltic, um, you know, Poland, Germany. There were, uh, it wasn't totally, um, you know, a complete conquest. You do have uh, EEF tribes like the Funnel Beakers that do coexist um, in Scandinavia. Uh, you do see a lot of uh, EFs intermarrying, um, you know, pretty much all women uh, with the Indo-Europeans in uh, Poland as well as Germany. Um, and, uh, you know, in areas like the Baltic, you do see the uh, survival of distinctive groups of hunter-gatherers in kind of remote parts of Estonia, um, you know, even for hundreds and hundreds of years after the uh, Indo-European arrival. Um, but they definitely were uh, very, very destructive. There's not much uh, evidence of Indo-European settlements at uh, this point from kind of the uh, 2900 to uh, 2500 BC period. Um, you know, there's evidence of nomadic camps. Uh, we have their pottery. We call it the corded ware. That's why they're called the corded ware culture or uh, in Scandinavia, the battle axe culture. Because um, one of the things they uh, loved doing was burying themselves with these, um, you know, battle axes that they uh, presumably used as weapons. Now, um, you know, the focus of this lecture isn't really on the Indo-Europeans, so we'll focus on the uh, EEFs. Uh, there was a depopulation zone, um, you know, that we see. Uh, it's most clear in kind of southern Czechia, uh, northern Austria, parts of Germany and Hungary, um, you know, where there's about 20 kilometers of uh, areas where there's just not really any archaeological finds for that 2900 to 2500 B BC um, period. The, um, you know, it looks like that was probably the war and raiding zone between the uh, Indo-Europeans and the uh, EEFs. Um, we do see, uh, you know, kind of the survival of those EEF groups, the Funnel Beakers in Denmark. What I think happened is it would have been something along the lines of what happened in uh, Mexico, where Cortez invaded um, Mexico and he got a bunch of native allies. Uh, you know, such as the Tlaxcala, and the Tlaxcala ended up being kind of friends with the um, Spanish in the end of mixing in with them and, you know, eventually becoming uh, Mexicans in large part. Um, I think it was probably something similar for some of those EEF groups that did survive the Indo-European invasion, at least in the initial phase. Um, so life kind of did go on. Um, you do see uh, the EEFs, um, you know, they continue to advance in areas like Spain, um, in Italy, there's evidence of, uh, you know, kind of issues in southern Italy with the uh, Minuans, um, you know, starting to expanding into the islands. So the Minuans, for whatever reason, did have a kind of advanced um, naval technology. And that would be the big issue that would really end the uh, early European farmers in the northern part of Europe. So, um, 
you have this thing called the, the bell beaker culture in the early part of the uh, third millennium BC, and it spreads uh, very quickly. All, similar to the megaliths, um, it spreads over the sea routes uh, first. It spreads from Spain. Um, you know, you start to see it spread into Italy uh, along the Danube River Basin, and eventually a lot of the Indo-Europeans end up adopting it. Uh, it is kind of a mysterious phenomenon, um, but it does go and convince the Indo-Europeans to start, start settling down. Uh, they start mixing with their EEF neighbors more, um, at least in Eastern Europe they do. Um, you know, and it also spreads, uh, most unfortunately for the EEF's uh, boat um, technology to the Indo-Europeans. Uh, so the, Indo the uh, EEFs in Britain, um, you know, the British, or I should say the, ancient, the prehistoric British, uh, as far as we can tell, and they don't really have any ancestral relationship to the uh, modern British, uh, just very, very little, maybe, you know, 6 to 8%. Um, you know, these are the people who are building Stonehenge. Um, you know, they're dragging uh, stones all the way from Wales to uh, southern Britain. Um, so they did have, you know, at least some sort of chiefdoms that were capable of organizing large efforts. You know, they had a, a, a hierarchy, political structure, um, you know, knowledge of calendars, all sorts of uh, wonderful things that would have made life somewhat more pleasant for, a, you know, Neolithic or society. Um, from what we knew in the classical period, the uh, they didn't really, you know, they didn't have computers. Um, you know, or a bureaucracy kind of on the level of what we have in the modern age. So a lot of the ways that states would collect revenue was actually international trade. Uh, even the Roman Empire, for instance, made about a third of its revenues from, um, you know, the trade along the Indian Ocean in particular, um, you know, as well as its uh, Egypt, which the Romans ran as basically a plantation. So it was kind of a very restricted number of income sources that provided you know, perhaps half to 60% of the revenues for the Roman state that enabled them to pay off their, uh, you know, local vassals to fund their legions. Now, the Romans, you know, they had uh, advantages of large economies of scale just due to the sheer size of their empire, you know, with 80 million or 100 million people, however many they had. Uh, the Neolithic states, uh, the EF states, um, most likely were a lot more robust. They probably relied a lot more on a local collection of grains, um, you know, and farm animals, that sort of thing, uh, as well as um, kind of corvy labor, much like the Egyptians did, uh, rather than international trade. But trade definitely was a big deal for them. Um, my theory is that once the Indo-Europeans, uh, particularly the single grave culture of northwestern Germany, started adopting uh, seafaring on a large level, um, you go and you see these Indo-European pirates start to disrupt the trade routes and that wrecks the finances of these uh, chiefdoms and states. And that could be a really big deal. Um, you know, like in the prehistoric world, you know, even in uh, the modern world, um, you know, you could, if you have a bad harvest or something, you don't necessarily have to starve. You could trade your surplus uh, from previous years, you know, luxury goods, weapons, uh, metals, you know, whatever you have, uh, for food from your neighbors who had a good harvest. So you wouldn't necessarily starve. When you have um, kind of a breakdown in trade, not only are you, you know, is your government losing those tax revenues, you're also having the issue where you can't trade your surplus for food when your civilization is, uh, you know, having a famine. Um, you know, so the population of the British Isles basically collapses. Um, you know, there's population collapse in a lot of parts of Europe at that time, actually. And I do believe that is uh, related to, you know, kind of the breakdown in tra trade routes. Uh, there is a theory that it was due to the spread of bubonic plague. There is evidence of plague as early as, I believe, uh, 3300 BC in Mongolia uh, with the arrival of the uh, Indo-European people who are most likely the uh, ancestors of the Tuharians um, to that region. So uh, the Indo-Europeans, by kind of creating this great, um, you know, step confederation uh, connecting Mongolia and East Asia to uh, Europe, uh, might have spread diseases that hadn't been to Europe before, and it might have had a uh, disastrous effect. Um, I personally don't really buy that theory, given that the Indo-Europeans would have been hit by the uh, plague as well. Um, you know, because what we see in, um, you know, we know that they did have at least some contacts with the uh, early European farmer societies, even if they didn't really mix with them that much. Um, you know, I don't see why they wouldn't have spread those diseases between themselves earlier and been hit every bit as hard as the uh, early European farmers were. Um, so I personally believe in the metal theory of the metal 
uh, theory of Indo-European expansion for 2900 BC, and then the uh, seafaring expansion for the uh, 2400 uh, BC expansion. Um, so the uh, early European farmers in um, Britain were basically totally destroyed. Um, you know, they were just annihilated. There weren't that many survivors. It's possible some of the priests survive. Um, we do see the uh, I-2 haplo group um, in southern, or not in southern, in a you know, part of a megalithic site in uh, Scotland um, as late as the late Bronze Age, so kind of the late 1000s BC. Um, you know, and that's a thousand years after the invasion. It could have come from uh, Europe as well. Um, but uh, I do think that is a, a possibility since we do know there were some survivors that uh, did mix in with Indo-Europeans in the British Isles. Um, going back a few hundred years before the uh, Indo-European conquest of Britain between 2400 and 2200 BC, uh, the Indo-Europeans had actually penetrated um, into kind of the Alpine uh, areas of Switzerland, um, as well as, uh, you know, the Basque areas, the Pyrenees, um, before their kind of second main wave of invasions uh, around 2400 BC. Uh, you start to see the spread of uh, R1A and R1B haplogroups, um, you know, in peoples of Switzerland. Uh, those are normally associated with the uh, spread of the Indo-Europeans. Um, and it might have been something along like what we see with uh, the spreads of actually those exact same haplogroups uh, within the Amerindian populations of the Americas. You have, um, you know, kind of guys that are, uh, you know, they know certain techniques of economy or, you know, they have trade links, um, you know, and they get absorbed into these uh, tribes, um, you know, and eventually become part of them. You know, similar, I think it was a similar... Um, thing for what was happening to the uh, Basques as well as the uh, EEFs of Switzerland. Um, so it wasn't all, you know, there definitely was some collaboration uh, between different groups at that point. Um, the uh, EEFs, they do pretty much get totally overrun in the uh, second wave of Indo-European conquests. Uh, the the Indo-Europeans overrun France, you know, replacing about half the population there. Um, they invade uh, Iberia as well, replacing about 20% of the population. Um, but they did go, and there were definitely groups that outlasted the initial conquest. Um, we have DNA samples from the Balearic Islands in the Western Mediterranean, um, you know, Menorca, Majorca, you know, the big uh, vacation points for German and uh, British tourists these days. Um, we actually have people who are basically pure EEF and ancestry, as well as uh, you know, people who are about 40% 40, 40 Indo European, 60% uh, EEF and ancestry uh, settling these islands together. So it's very, very early on in the uh, Indo European conquest of Iberia that, um, you know, they still haven't fully mixed and yet they're still uh, expanding by sea into, um, you know, the Western Mediterranean. Now, the uh, EEFs, they do go and survive in one particular place and have total conscience cultural continuity all the way through the uh, 6th century BC, and that's called the Neuragic Civilization on the uh, island of Sardinia. Now, the island of Sardinia even today has the highest amount of EEF ancestry in uh, all, you know, basically the whole world. Um, you know, the estimates run, the lowest I've seen was 62%, and the highest I've seen was about 80%. Um, and you have these highlands in the uh, center of Sardinia, and they remained uh, very difficult for anyone to conquer, you know, even into the, uh, you know, early modern period with uh, the various pirates, those sorts of things, um, you know, coming out of North Africa. And um, so uh, what would happen, um, and now Sardinia might have been, you know, we do see even in the Neolithic period, there's, uh, you know, people from North Africa, probably traders, um, you know, who are migrating from North Africa into uh, coastal Sardinia. Um, you know, as well as uh, Punic and uh, Phoenician colonization um, in the Bronze Age, like in uh, particularly in the you know Bronze Age collapse period, um, and they probably did play some role, at least according to Eric Klein in the uh, Sea Peoples. Um, so you have uh, what was I saying? Oh yes, you do have uh, these kind of highland peoples who keep a lot of the EF ancestry, and uh, one of the reasons I think for that was due to the higher disease burden being along the coasts. Um, 
you know, especially with the uh, spread of malaria in the classical period, I think you would have a lot of these uh, more diverse uh, trading peoples along the coasts would die off, um, you know, whereas the peoples from the uh, mountain hinterlands who didn't really have that uh, disease burden from malaria as badly because the high elevation and uh, fewer mosquitoes uh, would go and constantly replenish them. Um, so I do think that accounts for a lot of the uh, EEF survival um, in Sardinia and why it remained uh, kind of their stronghold all the way up into the uh, Carthaginian conquest. Um, so anyhow, they had this uh, very distinctive, they kept on building megaliths, um, you know, uh, long after everyone else had kind of forgotten about them. Or I guess that's kind of unfair. Um, one thing the Indo-Europeans did do was they seem, uh, particularly after the spread of the Bellbeaker culture, was to adopt the kind of megalithic religion of the early European farmers. We have, uh, you know, like Stonehenge being one famous example. The early stages were originally built by the EFs, but the uh, Indo-Europeans actually expanded upon it. And uh, we do see uh, similar things going on, um, even as far east as the Urals. Um, you know, there's uh, certain megaliths which may have been very well built by uh, kind of Indo-European peoples there. Um, you know, because we also see some stuff that looks like it might have been a uh, causeway enclosures, the Indo-Europeans uh, adopting EEF fortification techniques, you know, all the way far, far uh, to the east on the border of uh, Europe and Asia, you know, in those very, very remote areas. Um, in Scandinavia, you go and we'll see uh, Indo-European burials and megaliths hundreds of years after they were constructed. Um, and we also see uh, Indo-Europeans in the Balearic Islands and in uh, Sicily actually building um, megaliths all on their own, you know, after they've conquered these uh, early European farmer peoples. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I do think that they uh, did absorb some of that kind of EF priestly caste into, um, and you do see the survival of those like I2 haplogroups uh, within Indo-European populations. Um, you know, I do think that that religion kind of took off since the uh, early European farmers were considerably more advanced in, uh, you know, pretty much every way other than metallurgy and, um, you know, cart riding than the uh, Indo-Europeans were. Um, you know, like for one example, the uh, Kukucheni Trapalian peoples had actually invented electroplating. They had uh, crude batteries that they were using to uh, electroplate uh, certain things with gold, you know, and that was even in the uh, fourth millennium BC. So they were very, very, uh, you know, advanced compared to, uh, you know, their much savage uh, hunter-gatherer and uh, pastoral rivals to uh, the Eastern Steppe. Um, so the Nuragics, anyhow, uh, going back to them, and the, uh, you know, they had their own very distinctive architecture. Um, Eric Klein, the author of 1177 BC, which I very, very strongly recommend, I recommend great book. Uh, he believes that, um, you know, the Sardinians were one of the groups that was part of the Sea Peoples, uh, you know, and they were one of the reasons for the Bronze Age collapse and that they broke down the trade routes uh, that connected, you know, much of Europe, uh, Egypt, um, the steppe, as well as uh, the Middle East uh, by disrupting uh, the largest trade route, the one in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, from DNA, that's currently uncertain. Uh, there is evidence that the Mycenaean Greeks were part of the Sea Peoples, um, at least in the Levant. Uh, so whether or not the uh, Sardinians and the Neuragics, um were part of them, it's mo it's mostly conjecture based off uh, Egyptian sources right now. Um, but Eric Klein definitely believes so. Uh, so the the, the Neuragics ended up being conquered by the Carthaginians um, in the sixth century BC. I believe they were conquered by the Romans two hundred years later, and uh, eventually they became a Roman province, even if a remote one. Um, they ended up speaking, um, you know, their own dialect of Italian, which uh, as one Italian who I uh, talked to in last week's uh, lecture um, told me, it's still the most conservative uh, dialect of Italian and the closest to Latin. So it's always been kind of a remote area that's held out far longer than, uh, you know, any other areas. And that's why the uh, Sardinians are like they are today. So uh, I've gone a little bit over my one hour um, time limit. I hope you guys all learned something. I'm going to open it up for questions.